Hello to the. I'm sorry, did you say something? I was just saying hi to everybody who's here. <laughs> here let me turn off my mic. So. Rachel, are you able to send the link to the group me? Oh, I don't have y'all's group me, sorry. Oh, you don't? Okay, that's fine. Um, would you mind sending the link in our group chat that we have? Do you have the link? Um, I don't think I do, but I can try and get it. Okay. I think she sent it to us somewhere. Yeah, but I think that that link is just for us. Um, so I don't know. I'm trying to minimize to get the link, but it won't let me because I'm recording. It says I can't minimize because I'm recording. So okay. Let me try to see if I can get it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I sent out the links. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. And if people decide to trickle in. Um, okay. Okay, I'm sharing my screen with everyone. So welcome. Um, my name's Olivia, and I'm a senior at Montevallo High School. Hey guys, I'm Sula, and I am a senior at JCIB. And today we're going to be answering all your questions about college and senior year and um, what it's like to go through the process. So first, we want to address the elephant in the room, which is the amount of work that this can be and how stressful it can be. And so we wanted to remind everyone that it can seem really scary, but that it's gonna be okay. And that if you're feeling overwhelmed with the amount of applications or essays that you have to write, um, it's okay to step back and drop some things. Um, for example, I started senior year um, in I think it was like five clubs plus marching band and marching band took three hours every afternoon after school um, and with the school workload plus college applications plus my other clubs I decided to stop marching so that I would have time um, and at first I felt guilty for doing that felt kind of like um, maybe I should stay because it's my senior year, my last time. But as soon as I started applying for colleges and saw the time that I needed to devote, it was the right decision. Um, it was not high on my list of priorities. And so in order for me to accomplish all my goals, I needed to drop marching band. Um, and so it's important to recognize that in your senior year, you might need to step back and look 
um, at everything that's on your plate and decide what is most valuable to you. Yeah, and I have experienced this year as a similar thing where I just don't have as much time as I really thought I would have. Um, and like Olivia said, it's okay to step back and it's okay to, you know, maybe not be as involved as you were previously, just because um, it takes up a lot of time. Applying take up, takes up a lot of time. And so, and it takes a lot of willpower too. Um, you know, writing a lot of essays can be really taxing. Um, and basically just talking about yourself in these essays can be exhausting and that sort of thing. So um, don't, don't feel really bad about, you know, taking time for yourself um, and taking off time from even school. If, if there's a day where you're like, I just cannot uh, go to school today. I need to just take a break. Um, that's completely understandable. You're a senior. I feel like we've earned it at this point. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be okay. <laughs> so beginning the process, there are a lot of things that um, are going to, you're going to start seeing other people do them that are, you know, in your grade, and it's going to be time soon to start going on campus visits, establishing a list of colleges, writing your resume. Um, and so this is something that I thought I was very excited about and um, really enjoyed. I think it's the beginning of the process is really fun to kind of consider all of your options and getting to explore what your future is going to look like. Um, for me, my list of colleges was extremely long and it ended, it's still very long, <laughs> but I did, was able to cut down like 15 colleges um, based on what I liked and didn't like on campus visits, um, what kind of majors and minors they offered, where they were. And so um, I would suggest considering how far away you are okay with moving. For me, I wanted to stay in the South. Um, so, and I wanted to not be hours and hours away from my parents. And so that was a big consideration. So I really only applied to schools in the South. Um, it's also important to consider your match and your reach colleges. You want to have, I think the suggested number to apply to is eight. So you wanna have colleges that you know for sure you're going to get into and that you would you would be okay going there, you want to go there. And then you should have some colleges that are reach colleges, that their average GPA or ACT or SAT is above yours. Um, and, and it's less likely that you'll get in there, but you should still apply and go for it. Um, because who knows, you know, they, you might write a really, really killer essay um, and, you know, you might be accepted. Um, and then writing your resume, I think I did this the summer of my junior year and I sent it away to a, a professional resume writer that I knew um, to look over it and help me format it. And you don't have to do that. There are a lot of people at um, your, your high school, your counselor will know how to do it. I suggest um, finding a template online and writing your resume and then sending it to someone to make sure that someone who's actually applied to jobs and college knows more about what they're looking for. And so that way they can say, you do not need to put this in there or you should add this. Um, and so Sila has been on a few more campus visits um, if she wants to talk about that. Yeah, so um, I was lucky enough to be able to go visit some campuses. So I visited um, UChicago, which is my number one right now, um, Georgetown, and I was able to visit Harvard. Um, and something that you get from campus visits, if you can go to these campuses, and even though I went far away, you know, if you're applying locally, like if you're applying to Alabama or Auburn or UAB, it's still incredibly important to tour those places if you can, um, just because it gives you an idea of being in that environment. And for me, that's really important because I tend to, my moods tend to go with my environment. So if I'm surrounded by things that make me happy, you know, that's really important to me. Um, 
And so, yeah, if you can visit the campuses, um, of course, right now during COVID, it is really hard. Um, I was able to go during a kind of um, good time in terms of the numbers of COVID. Um, and so that was really lucky. But, um, you know, if you can't visit, that is completely okay. I would argue that doing the virtual tours on the website can give you just as much information. Um, and I did some virtual tours of campuses that I wasn't really wanting to go to per se, but just wanting to check out. Um, and so they'll usually have these virtual tours where you can just kind of walk around the campus and it'll show you different images um, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and like Olivia, my list was really long too. Um, and so I was able to narrow it down to eight colleges um, that I applied to. And at the beginning I had like 25. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, the, the more you engage with the colleges, whether it's in terms of their campus or their student life and that sort of thing, um, the more you will find places that are more fit to what you're wanting. And it's okay to not know what you want. Um, I really didn't even know what I wanted till I would say maybe October of this year. Um, and I, I had to apply to a, like a few of these places November 1st. Um, so it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to really not know anything um, and not know what you want. It'll, it'll work out. It'll be okay. I have a friend who, uh, so I live in Montevallo and the campus, University of Montevallo is right next door um, to our high school. And so I have a friend who wasn't really sure about staying in town, like didn't want to go to UM, uh, but then she went on a tour and now she loves it and really wants to go there. Um, and it, it just seems like the perfect place for her now that she's been there and knows more it's you know it's not just the college across the street she got to really learn about it and so even if you think yes I know everything about that campus I know the professors you know I know what it's going to be like if I go there you probably don't and you should go on a campus visit because there's so much to learn um, so then college applications the real meat and potatoes um, it there's a variety of different topics in college applications. So if there's something that we don't cover, please um, submit a question in the little Q&A box. Um, I didn't love the application process. I don't think anyone does, but um, it did help me later apply for scholarships because college applications ask you for a variety of different essays or like long answers. And I was able to reuse those for my scholarships. So they ask you a bunch of questions, but eventually you'll get to the point where you've answered all of them already and you can just resubmit, edit, you know, to specifically answer their questions, but you'll have the basic um, structure for all of your essays, which is really nice. Um, test scores are kind of a weird topic right now because a lot of colleges have been waiving them um, because of COVID and some are continuing to make them optional. Some are going back to required test scores. For me, I um, a lot of my reach colleges because I had test I have test scores that are lower than their average. And if they're optional, I don't submit my test scores because my GPA or my essays are a better representation of me than my ACT score. And so if you are looking at colleges and thinking, I'll never get in there because my ACT score is lower or my SAT score is lower, they might be optional and then just don't submit it, you know? And for me, because a lot of schools are going optional with the scores, it allowed me in my junior year to stop taking the SAT um, and the ACT. I took both of them. Um, I was taking them, trying to get my score up, trying to get my score up. And then eventually, you know, it was like, how much is, how worth it is it? Because I was spending hours studying and that's good. And you should, and you should prepare for those exams. But once you take them and take them maybe twice, you know, you can step back, especially when these schools are going optional and say, okay, I won't send them, send them here. I will send them here. Um, and I think that's a really great change that's happening. Um, and so I already talked about essays a little bit. Um, again, that's kind of a very complex topic. And so if you have specific questions, 
for me, my personal essay, which is what you need for your common app. And a lot of schools ask for a personal essay where they don't give you a prompt, you just write something. Um, and so I wrote about, I mean, you're supposed to write about yourself. So I wrote about um, the clubs that I'm in and the the kind of the things that I do at my school um, and how that kind of represents me. Um, and so I know that there's a lot of pressure for essays to be super deep and have a double meaning. And that's great if you can do that. Um, but if you feel super stressed out about your essay being good enough, um, it probably is. There are so many different types of personal essays that you can submit. Um, and I think that you don't just have to do what you see on YouTube videos, do something that really does represent you. And then the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is the different application types, because these can be a little bit confusing. Um, and it's something that I didn't know about until I started. So most schools offer a regular decision, an early decision, and then some, some schools offer early action. So a regular decision has um, a, usually a later application deadline. Um, and then you'll hear most regular decisions depending on the school, late March, early April, some of mine were in January for regular decisions. So it, it depends on the school, but that is the last um, decision day. So if you apply early decision, that means that your application is due earlier. You'll hear back from them earlier. However, you are committing to that school if you get in. So if I apply early action, um, or I'm sorry, early decision, and I get into that school, I am committed there regardless of other schools that accept me. Um, and then for early action, that is kind of the same deal where you apply early and you hear earlier. However, you're not committing. Um, and so not every school offers that, but I would suggest if you are done with your, app, or if you see that the school offers early action to try to do those first so that you can get in early action. So that way you'll hear your decision sooner. Yeah, and um, it can be really confusing, this early action versus early decision. The way that I kind of remember it is like early decision. I have made my decision. This is where I want to go. Um, so I applied early action to Georgetown and New Chicago. Um, and I got deferred from both and deferred means you're not accepted, but you're not declined, like you're not denied. Um, and so it means that they will, they will look at your application again, um, during the regular decision or yeah, the regular decision, um, you know, sort of pool of applicants. Um, and so it'll give you this time. Um, to basically beef up your application. Um, and I wrote an article on getting deferred and what you can do. Um, but the basics of it are like, do all of the optional things. Um, if you really, really want to get into this place, um, show them that you really, really want to get into this place by doing all these optional essays. Um, for you, Chicago, there was an optional uh, like personal video. So it's like a video that has to be under two minutes and you just talk about yourself or you talk about something that's important to you. Um, and so just doing that, I mean, a lot of students don't take time to do that. If you do that, um, it'll show them that you're really interested. And also writing letters of continued interest, um, that's important because it lets them know that they are still your top choice. Um, and even, you know, name dropping. Like if, if you've spoken to a student who goes there and they have helped you along in the process or if there's even a professor that you emailed or something and you said, hey, you know, I like um, what you're teaching. What are you guys up to in terms of research opportunities and that sort of thing. Usually they will respond because um, they wanna help you out and they're excited to talk about their research. Um, so I recommend doing that if you get deferred. Um, and then with early decision, uh, one thing is if you can prove that you can't pay for it and you do get in, um, they, they will work with you. So it's not like, you know, you do early decision. Oh no, you can't pay for it. You know, they will, they'll let you off the hook. 
um, if you can't pay for it. So, and another thing is <laughs> you can technically apply early decision to a few different places, um, but that is very risky because then that would mean that you are binding to multiple colleges if you get into all of them. Um, and that's a really tricky situation. Um, and so I would really urge uh, early action over pretty much anything. Um, so yeah, and then also back to test scores. I am also one of those people who I don't really test as well as my GPA shows or my extracurriculars or that sort of thing. And so I would say like, it, it takes a, a good amount of pressure off knowing that if it's optional um, and just, just try your best. Don't put too much pressure on it because it's just a number <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't define your academic excellence or anything like that. I think GPA probably shows more in my opinion, just because it shows the hard work you put in each year. Um, and of course, everything is relative because of COVID and that sort of thing. Um, so just don't get too caught up with the numbers. Um, if you do, if you get in your head about it, your application might not be as good because you're kind of accepting failure before you even do it. So keep, a mindset that's like, I'm gonna represent myself the best way I can. Um, I'm gonna show them who I am and I'm gonna show them the best, the best parts of myself. Um, just keep this mindset where it's like, I am my own advocate and that sort of thing. Um, Cause it'll take you a long way. They can, they'll notice, they will see um, when you are interested in them and they can read through stuff. So if you know, you're not really interested in the college, they can probably tell. Um, and if you don't spend that much time on an application, they can also probably tell. Um, so just prioritize the colleges that you really wanna get into. Um, and yeah, just, just use your energy wisely. Yeah, and then for getting it done, kind of what she was saying is prioritizing. That's one of the things that helped me. I. I suggest applying to eight colleges. I applied to 15. Not that that was the smart move, but for me, what helped me apply to 15, if you're like me and really cannot narrow down your list, I um, sorted my list into tiers of, I, I really want to go here, um, was tier one. And it's likely that I'll, that I, it's not a reach. So it's, it's more likely that I'll get in. And um, it's likely that if I get in, I will be able to afford it. So that was tier one. And then tier two is, I really, really, really want to go here. Probably, you know, it's a reach. I, I might not get in because of my scores or whatever. And then third would be, I'm not completely sure if I'm going to get in. And it's, you know, the least my least favorite of the schools on my list. And so I split it into tiers and I worked on tier one first and put my, the most, um, all of my effort into tier one. And that way um, I was applying early action to those schools. I was putting, you know, my best, my, you know, not so tired of college applications self into those applications and then do tier two and then do tier three. Um, and that also really helped me time things out and make sure that I was prioritizing my favorite schools first. So then the FAFSA, um, this is a form that helps you receive financial aid and Sila is going to talk a little bit about this. Okay, so the FAFSA, it is, um, it seems like it is probably going to be super, super hard. I'm not going to lie, it does take up time, but I was surprised when I got to it that it actually wasn't too terrible. Um, <laughs> um, and of course that depends on how much information you have from your parents. Um, but what you're gonna wanna do is the application usually opens on October 1st. Um, and I recommend getting it done as soon as you can because it once you get it done, it makes so, like everything else so much easier. Um, because you'll have these numbers and by having these numbers, you can know what they are when you're doing scholarships. Um, and so when you're filling it out, 
you know, have your guardian, your parent, whoever is the financial um, lead person in your family, have them sit down with you, talk about, you know, what you need on there. If they want to do it, let them do it. Um, <laughs> but if you want to be more involved in the process, like, you know, taking a initiative with just making sure that it's all right, which is how I was, because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, <laughs> I was, I just sat down with my dad and I was like, hey, you know, can we do this? Can we knock this out quickly? Um, and it really went by fairly quickly. Um, just after you make sure you have all the documents and everything, um, it, it usually goes well and you're probably like, what documents? what I have no idea what this is it's your parents tax returns from the year previous so ours was from 2020 um and so whatever year you're applying for it'll usually be so if you're applying next year it'll be 2021 um and so if you have those documents usually you'll have to sign into the IRS that sort of thing all these you feel like an adult doing it so it's a little bit fun it's a little bit like oh, yay, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, and so basically, if, if you can fill it out as fast as you can, I totally recommend it because it, it just made everything else so much easier. Um, and so the number that you'll get will be expected family contribution. Um, and so that will be the amount of money, roughly, um, that colleges expect you to pay for. Um, so usually it can be anywhere from like 5,000 to, I don't know, a higher number if your family has a higher income. Um, but it's really important because colleges can see, you know, how they can support you financially. Um, and so it actually in the state of Alabama, it's required to fill out the FAFSA now um, in order to graduate. Um, and that's a good thing because um, it really does help out students, even though sometimes they give you a number and you're like, oh, I wish it were higher um, or lower because you don't want your family to pay as much. But um, so, yeah, it gives you a good idea of, you know, how you should prepare um, for financially supporting yourself in college and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, this time last year, I had no idea like what the FAFSA entailed, but there are a lot of resources out there um, for the FAFSA. So if you look up YouTube videos or even just like on the government website, they'll tell you basically what to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not too, too horrible. <laughs> and if you need extra help or um, don't know how to get the documents that you need, um, I would suggest talking to your counselor at your school, they're very familiar with the FAFSA and they're there to help you. Um, I know that our counselor came in and did a presentation about it. So they have the information. Um, if you need further assistance, I'm sure they will help you. So now everyone's favorite scholarships. So first we're gonna talk about outside of your college's scholarships. So scholarships that you'll apply to on websites like Unigo, scholarships.com. These are scholarships not provided by the schools that you're applying to, but by other organizations. Um, so when I started the process before starting my applications, like the summer um, before senior year, I applied for a bunch of $500, $1,000 scholarships, which if you add it up, that can make a big difference. However, it is very, very difficult to get these scholarships because lots of students are applying for them. So if there are no essay scholarships or you have some, some kind of um, essay that you already have written and you wanna apply, great. But I would not suggest spending a lot of your time on these outside scholarships because in the end, like I didn't get any of them. So you're, you're less likely to get them um, and it's, it can be just a waste of time. Um, if it's a scholarship that's in your community or an organization that you're a part of, that might be more worth your time if you're um, more confident about, you know, being considered. But it's 
just very difficult to receive the scholarships that are on the scholarship website that you'll find. I know a lot of counselors will send them out. Um, and if you if you want to, and if you have extra time, that's great. But I just wouldn't suggest spending a lot of your time on it um, because in the end, it usually is not worth it. Yeah, and I would um, pay attention to the more well-known scholarships. So, um, for example, the Questbridge scholarship, um, it's really well known and it, it doesn't just give you a scholarship, but it gives you a leg up um, in college applications. So as a junior, I think you can apply right now unless the deadline has passed. Um, and if you're a sophomore, look out for it because um, it's for, you know, families who have less financial, you know, privilege. And so it allows you to have these resources by applying to the QuestBridge program. Um, um, LIDA is a similar organization and it provides summer classes uh, the summer before senior year. Um, and I have a friend who got into LIDA and she has just, she has had such a great experience and she's had so many resources and They've just helped her with college in general, just applying to colleges, and they help pay for five colleges to apply to. Um, and so they basically cover the application, um, the application uh, fees. And so um, if you if you get emails from these organizations, definitely apply to them. Um, and also there are some other scholarships that are huge. And so it's really hard to get into them like the Koch scholarship. Um, I know a former springboarder got the Koch scholarship at one point, um, but she clearly, I guess she was part of, you know, um, I guess some sort of community that they were really good at. <laughs> like finding out how to get the co scholarship because she had a lot of resources to do it. And she recommended it to me, but um, basically the first round is autom automated by a computer. Um, and so it's kind of, it's not very personal. Um, and so you kind of have to really figure out how to apply to some scholarships, how to, I guess, find out loopholes to get in which I don't think it should be that way, but whatever. Um, so you have to keep in mind that a lot of these scholarships, even though they're scholarships, they can be kind of, um, you know, like any college process, just kind of icky, you know, um, not as open to everyone as they should be. I mean, cause the first round was computer generated. Um, and so, and like my friend who got into Lita, um, who works really hard and, you know, everything, she got the same results as I did. With the Coke scholarship. So just keep in mind, like, don't put yourself down if you don't get these scholarships, just because, like Olivia said, there's so many people applying. And like it's it's just really hard to be literally one in a million. <laughs> it's it's just hard to um be narrowed down when you have so many people, especially during COVID, where you know it's it's hard for families to pay, especially for college. Just keep in mind, like it doesn't define you just like the ACT doesn't define you. It's okay if you don't get these scholarships. There are other ways and colleges are willing to work with you, um, especially if, you know, if you get into a match or reach school, they will often know that it's less likely that you'll be able to pay for, you know, full price of tuition and they'll be willing to work with you. Um, and I really recommend reaching out once you do get into these colleges, reaching out to financial um, aid people at the college because they are willing to help you. Um, and also once you get into colleges, go on their website, look at the scholarships you can apply for. That's where you're gonna get a lot of the scholarships. Um, the ones that are school scholarships that are just for that school. Um, and there's like tons of lists of them and you can filter them usually by you know, whether it's major, if you're a female, they'll give out scholarships for that. Um, you know, if you're a female in STEM, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I really recommend doing that as opposed to <laughs> these outside scholarships, but QuestBridge and LIDA are really good programs. So um, if you want to apply to them, those are two good options.
So for school scholarships, that is where um, most people are most successful and where I have been the most successful. Um, there are merit-based scholarships that for most colleges you're considered for in your application to the college. So you don't have to do another application. That's gonna be based on your ACT or SAT score or your GPA. Um, and that's usually, you know, you'll the, the higher your GPA, the more money you'll get. Um, and so those are really great, um, especially if you are not submitting your ACT score um, and you have a really high GPA, then you'll get the GPA money instead of the ACT score money. So that can be really convenient um, if you're not, if you don't really love your score. Um, and then like Sheila was saying, there, there are scholarships at schools um, that are specifically for smaller demographics um, that you can look for and apply to. Uh, so as soon as I finished my basic application process, that's when I started to go into these schools and looking at their other um, scholarships and their other like honors college applications. Um, and so even though I finished applying, I you know, still have um, a good way to go with these scholarships because there are so many, um, which is fantastic. And so a lot of schools um, will have, like I said, an honors program that you can apply to, um, like a, a college program that will give you some money and then you might also get special housing. So there's lots of different options for school scholarships. Um, and I would suggest applying to as many as you can because um, you're way more likely to get those than the outside scholarships. Some colleges um, will, when you apply, you will be automatically um, entered into all of their scholarships, which is really cool. So you don't have to do any other applications. So I would go in and make sure that you know which colleges you're gonna have to apply for the honors program and so on, and which colleges are gonna automatically apply you for those programs. Um, and then in your application, or I'm sorry, in your decision letter, you'll receive your merit-based scholarship. And then if you um, receive any other scholarships um, based on your, your initial application, and then you might be invited to apply for a much bigger scholarship. So um, those might be in multi-steps. So you might, in your decision letter, it might say you're invited to apply for XY scholarship. And then um, you can, it's usually an application process like an essay and then you'll usually need to do an interview or some type of video um, and so those are can be worth full tuition and all that and that just comes from your basic application so um, if you're really worried about whether or not you're going to be able to afford a school that can you know you can basically know when you receive your letter um, if especially for those schools that you're automatically applied for all the scholarships if that's going to be an option for you based on scholarships, which is for me, especially for the early action, which is really great because then you don't have to, to wait till, you know, graduation day when you, May 1st, when you know, um, I think that's the decision day, when you know what you're going to be able to afford. Um, so I would really suggest the school scholarships. Um, like at University of Alabama, they have a program called the Fellows Experience, which my brother um, was in, and he received a scholarship, and then you take classes and you get to go on a, a trip with them. And so it's this whole big program and you have to kind of, you don't really have to dig for it, but you have to at least know to look for it sometimes, um, you know, so it's important to be looking online. What, what scholarships, what programs do, does UA offer? Not just scholarships, but what programs does um, this university offer and this college offer? Because those are probably gonna come with scholarships as well. So I would apply to everything um, after you've done your basic college application process. So then interviews, these can be really stressful. I have done, I think I've done three and I have um, three more coming up in a couple of weeks. In the next few weeks, um, I went on Tuesday, but these can be scary. But after doing three, I feel like I can can do it. Um, initially, the first interview was a little bit shaky, but then you know I got better. Um, so colleges, when you have submitted your application, they will send you a portal, and the portal will send you to um, their page. 
uh, where you will create an account and you'll see that you've submitted your essay, you submitted your transcript, your, your, recommend, your recommenders have submitted their recommendations. And then some schools will um, ask if you want to have an interview. Some schools will email you and say, um, sign up for an interview time. Um, and I would always take the interviews or sign up for an interview, even if it's optional. It won't negatively impact you if you don't, but it will positively impact you if you do. Um, and it's really, it's not crazy likely that you're going to go in and they're just gonna hate you and not recommend you. It's way more likely that you're just gonna get a positive recommendation because I know that everyone, all, all of Girl Spring and all of you guys are impressive and you know not you're not going to say anything that's going to make them reject you from the school like you've got it um and so i would really suggest doing interviews i did one in person and two on zoom on zoom i tried to you know you need to dress professionally and, and in person dress impressively brush impressively uh, anyways what was i said yeah I, I don't know uh what word i mixed up on there but anyways <laughs> you should dress professionally that's what i was trying to say um, and try to have a, a nice background that is not distracting, probably not like my room. Um, but then they're going to ask you about yourself. Um, and so I would think about, you know, the clubs that you're in, what, what is the last book that you read or the last movie that you watched? What kind of things are you passionate about? So like, I really love the Muppets. Um, and so that's something that if they're looking for kind of a quirky, kind of unique answer, you want to kind of be thinking about what is really interesting about me, which I know is kind of like a weird question to ask yourself. Um, because there are things interesting about you, even if, it, you, you know, you have to ask your friends. Um, and so I would kind of prepare, think about yourself, think about um, what kind of challenging classes you've had, when you've challenged yourself. Um, a time when you had to make a decision, a time um, when you made the wrong decision. Um, those are, you know, the basic questions you can look up online, what kind of college interview questions am I going to be asked? Um, the most important thing is to recognize that the person that you're talking to doesn't want you to fail, like they want you to do well. And so it's not like do or die, like they're going to help you they're going to ask questions that they want to have a conversation with you so um i wouldn't get too stressed out about it i would just go in and be yourself and um really push yourself you know like push your personality and who you are because if you seem like you um don't don't have answers to the questions or you don't really know when you challenge yourself then that you know is going to be where it things get awkward so i would Think about your experiences, your time in high school, um, things that you like, and just go in and, you know, have a conversation with this person. Yeah, I think, I think the key word is it's a conversation. Don't be so rigid because um, just, you just have to be confident in yourself and that's easier said than done. Um, but the more you seem comfortable and, you know, good in your own skin, the more that you're going to get that momentum um, and you're going to you're going to go with it with each question um, and be honest, be honest in your interview. Don't be embarrassed of any answers like show your passions, show what gets you mad. Like um, in my inter I had one interview um, and it was required for Georgetown. And he asked, you know, what is one thing that you could get up on a soapbox and just talk about? And I talked about COVID and vaccines um, and I didn't hold back. Um, and of course that can be, opinions can vary, um, but I just talked about it. And more than likely they are really wanting you to talk about something that you are passionate about. So don't hold back. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard in the moment to, you know, really be thinking about how you're portraying yourself. But in the end, if you say what you want to say, you're going to be proud of yourself. Um, and you're going to know that you came across the way that you are um, in the interview. So that's really important. Um, and it's just another person. This person is not going to be determining whether you get in to this college or not. It is an important thing. Like Olivia said, 
it'll help you. Um, it's on extremely rare occasions. And my interviewer told me this, he was like, I've only had maybe two or three cases where it negatively impacted the person. He's done hundreds of thousands of interviews. Um, and so more, it's more likely that <laughs> it'll reflect well on your application, so. And then one more thing about the interview, um, I would suggest writing down and going in with questions for them. One of my interviewers really enjoyed talking about her college experience. Um, and so that was half of the interview was her telling me why I should go to that college, not quizzing me or, you know, asking me about myself, which we did at the beginning, but then a lot of it was her and I just having a conversation about what she loved about that school. And so when they pair you up, usually with interviewers, it's going to be based on where you are located. So I also did an interview with Georgetown and they um, matched me up with someone from Birmingham. So they, the people that you're interviewing with or who are interviewing you will be usually from your location. And so I asked them like, what was the transition from Alabama to DC like? What did you like about Georgetown and so on? So it's really important to go in with some questions questions that apply directly to the school, like what kind of extracurricular activities um, are similar to this, or what can I get involved with, where can I work on campus, so on. Um, and then also questions for your interviewer. Um, how, what made you decide on this school? You know, what was the transition like, and so on, because they, they want to talk to you about why you should go to their school too, and they want to talk about themselves as well. So um, it's important to go in with some questions. Okay. So we've made it to the end of the presentation. Um, a reminder that you have got this. It seems right now more stressful than it is. I mean, there are moments, but ultimately you've got it. Um, you're gonna do great. And we have so much confidence in you. Please ask questions if you have them. Um, and then if you have questions after this, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to Seela or I. Um, we would love to answer any further questions. Um, and while you guys are thinking of your questions, um, I, I, I wanted to say like, I've had trouble in the past being proactive about college applications just because I'll think of it and it'll kind of just get me down because I'll just kind of think, oh, what are the chances of me getting in? Um, and so it's really common to have these times where you just feel like you just can't, you just can't do it. Um, and honestly, it really just takes time. Um, and so, and that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. Um, and so if you're really feeling not motivated, it's okay. Um, it, it, it'll pass. You'll eventually find a college that really makes you want to apply. Um, and that's a very exciting feeling where you're really trying to put yourself into this application. Um, so yeah, and then we didn't really talk about like, you know, uh, recommendations or the process of reaching out to your counselor or that sort of thing. So if you'll have questions about that, um, you can of course ask them. We do have one question. Um, other than location, likely to, sorry, wait, did someone say something? No, I think I, I think I, uh, echoed. Okay. Other than location, likely to being accepted, et cetera. What are things you considered when picking colleges? Olivia, do you want to answer this first? Sure. Um, so I considered, well, first it's really important to think about women's colleges, um, versus, the regular colleges. So um, I know that some people or some girls don't, just don't want to go to all women's college, which is like totally fine. I personally think that that would be a fantastic option for me. Um, and I am totally open to an all women's college. So that was one of the first thing that one of the first things that I considered um, was what type of college. Then you want to consider size. For me, it size doesn't really matter. So from really, really small schools to really large, I applied to both. Um, look, or I already said location, but like location as in whether you wanna be in a city or in a smaller area. Um, it's important to think about demographics at the school. Um, if you 
are don't want to go to a school that's like 75 percent white it's important to go look at you know how many people of color how many um women go to a school if it's majority male that might be a no-no for you um no no i don't know why i said that um but there are lots of different things to consider um i think those were my main things was about being in the south and um being um at a school that has women's studies which is what i want to major in um and so what about you sula um, like you said, I really wanted to make sure that there was diversity in the places I was applying to. Um, and so I, and, you know, thinking about the background of the schools, um, it's, <laughs> there is not one college in the U.S., I feel, that has not had a problematic background. And that's really sad. Um, but if you can research that school and just feel proud about going there um, in terms of the values and um, the ethics of that school, I think that that can be really empowering. Um, and so just keeping in mind, you know, that you could represent this school as a student. Um, and then also I applied to a lot of colleges that are more in the North um, because I like cold, <laughs> I like the cold weather. So that's something to keep in mind, um, whatever weather or climate that you prefer. So like if you want it to be, you know, warmer, um, you know, maybe applying in the South is a better option or even on the West Coast. Um, and, you know, just thinking about like being close to your parents or your family, not that I don't want to be close with them. It's just that I think that they could easily visit me um, and I could easily visit them. So thinking about the logistics of things really um, can help. Um, and yeah, I think population, um, you know, how many people go there? I was honestly like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what a sort of preference would be. Um, so I applied to kind of a good range of schools. Like I applied to Alabama, which has a lot of people, but then I also applied to U Chicago, who has like 1200 people per class. Um, so yeah, it really just depends on what you're vibing with. And another thing um kind of the campus like what it looks like is also important but then one thing that was important to me was the study abroad options so um I applied to Agnes Scott um and that's a school that's really high up on my list and it's in Georgia and one of the things that I really really liked is that um every single student gets to study abroad um and that cost is included in tuition so that is really really cool and was a really important part of it for me was that if I can't afford to go there, can then I also afford to study abroad, you know? So I think that's also, um, when you look ahead at what you want your college career to look like, it's important to um, study abroad and other options. So Bella asked, um, when did you start asking for recommendation letters? Um, when did you start communicating with your school's college counselor? If I remember, I asked for recommendation letters, I guess it was as soon as the school year started um, because for my teachers, I tried to ask as early as possible because you want to give them time. If you're up against a deadline, um, I would suggest two weeks prior to the deadline is when you should ask. Um, so try not to do it like a week before. Um, but I tried to give them as much time because I knew that I was going to be applying early action. So I wanted to get them in early. So um, I would look at your application deadlines and see when you need to be like two weeks before that when you need to be asking. Um, and then I asked, I think I had two, two or three outside letters from outside of school. And then I had two teacher recommendations. And I only asked those five people and then continued to continue to use those recommendations in scholarship applications and all of my colleges. So you don't wanna ask a million different people, try to limit it. Um, but if a college, I think the highest I was allowed to submit was three per section. So it's usually teacher recommendation letters and then outside recommendation letters. So I wouldn't ask for more than three because you don't really need it. Yeah, um, I'd say the absolute minimum is two weeks. Even at two weeks, teachers will be like, ah, because they have tons of recommendations to write especially if you go to a school that has a lot of people 
they're writing recommendations left and right. And so the earlier you do it, the better quality your recommendation is probably going to be. Um, and I, I usually tried to shoot for a month ahead of time, um, just because I wasn't sure where I would be applying if I would even do early action. Um, and so I didn't, I wasn't as quick to send out my uh, recommendation requests. Um, and something that's really important is one, sending them an email, two, checking in with them in person if you can, um, because they're gonna remember that interaction and be like, oh, she came to me, she talked to me about this, she thanked me for considering it. Um, and that goes a long way um, because just writing an email, anyone can do that. Um, but if you go to them and ask them in person, um, then that's really helpful. And then also in the emails that you send, be sure to tell them what you need from them, what time you need them, what the deadlines are. And usually teachers will ask you to send them follow-ups so that they can make sure they get them in on time because they don't, they don't want to be the reason why you don't get in. <laughs> and so, you know, don't be afraid to send them follow-up emails or remind them about things um, because this is your college experience and they they know how important it is so yeah um let's see well, so I we have oh sorry thing. go ahead olivia um sorry but i just wanted to remind one of the one of the important things about writing a resume early is that when you send if you ask for a recommendation letter it's really useful for your recommender to have your resume. So send your resume when you're asking them to write your letter, because that way they have things to say about you. They can say, this is this person maintains a blah, blah, blah GPA while also participating in and then a list of your extracurriculars. So that way they know more about you than just that you are a good student in English class and they have things to say. Um, and then at my school, a lot of teachers have um, sheets where they um, you have to submit it to them in order to ask for a recommendation so it'll say i guess it kind of asks the same things that are on your resume so they know what to say about you um and so just be on the lookout for that if your teacher has like certain forms that they want you to submit when you're asking them to recommend them okay so we have a question that asked what was your experience like in picking a major slash how did you know what you were passionate about um that's a good question. Um, a lot of times uh, people will enter college as undecided. Like that is a lot of times college counselors will honestly be expecting that um, just because you don't have that much experience. I personally really love biology. Um, and so for all the colleges that I applied to, I applied for biology major or anything similar to that, like genetics. Um, you know, molecular biology, that sort of thing, um, cellular biology. Um, and so it honestly, it's, it's not that big of a deal if you don't know what you're going to do. Um, but just think about like, what makes you happy when you're at school? What class do you look forward to? What if you were, if you were given a paper, you know, which one would you be more, most enthusiastic about? Um, and so you know, I kind of realized this year, I was like, I kind of incorporate science into a lot of the papers I write, like, um, for, I had a huge history essay I had to write, and I wrote about the 1918 pandemic, and I was like, oh, I'm even incorporating science into that, and so it kind of helped me notice that, like, that's what I really like, and that's what I really like to talk about, um, and who knows, like, I am open to change if in the future I'm like, you know, this isn't actually for me. I know that I will try my best in any sort of major that I pick. Um, and so be willing to change. Um, it's okay if you don't know. And it's okay if you pick something and later on you're like, okay, maybe this isn't for me. Usually you don't even have to declare a major until the end of your sophomore year of college. So um, it's not a huge deal when you're applying. Um, but yeah, it just, just think about what you like. Don't push yourself in a direction that maybe if your parents are like, oh, we really want you to be this, or, you know, if your friends are, you know, leaning towards something and you're the only one who isn't super into it, do what you like. Don't, don't let other people, you know, sort of sway you one way or another. 
Yeah, my answer is basically the same. Um, like I know people who are who I was friends with in high school that are now in college. I have friends who have switched their major four or five times. It's really not a big deal if you don't know what you want to do or if you're just not sure that what you're interested in is going to lead you anywhere. If you're, you know, you're not sure when you start studying it, if that's going to be maintain its interest. Um, so for me, I want to study women's studies and film studies. Um, the women's studies thing just comes from Girl Spring and um, my club at my high school called Z Club, which is a women's service and advocacy club. I went to Girl State. And so, you know, all of these things that I've done in my high school career have kind of just, you know, it just makes sense. Um, that's, it just showed, it was obvious to me that that was what I was interested in. And I wasn't even doing it intentionally. It was just like, oh, women's studies exist? Yes, that's what I like to do. Um, and then for film studies, that's something that's kind of like new. And I'm honestly expecting for that to not stick around <laughs> because over COVID, I um, found this list of movies based on a TV show thing. And um, I started watching all these movies. And then I started thinking about women in movies. And I started writing about women in film on Girl Spring and all this stuff. So it just seems like I'm interested in it and I've been curious about it for about a year now. And so even though it's not something that my whole life has been dedicated to learning about film, no, I know nothing about film, but I kind of think that it would be interesting. So that is why I've been saying that I wanna study film. So it's really not about um, your lifelong passion. You know, it's more about what you're interested in and um, being open to change, like Sila said. Yeah, and and like Olivia said, you don't you don't really have to be like, you know, putting blinders on, have tunnel vision to have just one thing. Like, um, I'm also interested in policy. And so, um, you know, politics and that sort of thing, not saying that I'd want to be in politics, but I'm interested in incorporating maybe bio biological policy. So in terms of, you know, public health and that sort of thing, um, foreign relations. Um, and so, you know, you, there are a lot of majors out there. Um, and there are a lot of very unique majors out there, like um, a major at Georgetown that I'm really interested in is biology of global health. And um, I spoke to one of the admissions counselors and she was like, we barely have anyone in the program. And yet we have a lot of people interested in biology, a lot of people interested in politics because, you know, it's in D.C. Um, and I, I, I read the major and I was like, this is awesome. Um, and so just do some digging, um, look for things that can be like a niche sort of thing. Um, because that way you'll be able to figure out probably quicker what you do or do not enjoy. And, you know, if you're saying like, I want to be a doctor, remember that you have not had, you know, this in-person experience. Like if you get to that point and you are working you know, as like a, an assistant or something, you know, in college or at an internship. And you're like, I really don't like this, the actual hands-on-ness of being like a doctor. That is okay because you haven't experienced that before. Um, and so it's, it's pretty unreasonable to, at the age of 18, know what you're gonna do for the rest of your life, so. And for me, you know, women's studies and film studies, I have no idea what kind of job that might lead to. And that has been, you know, at first I was like, well, I can't, I can't study women's studies. The only option is that I'm going to be a professor or a teacher or something. But honestly, in the world that we are in today, we are going to college for jobs that do not exist yet. And we are studying things um, and preparing for careers that we haven't even heard of. And so it's important to, I, I believe it's important to follow what you're interested in and your passions instead of the money or a job, because you're going to, you know, be happiest when you pursue your passions and you're going to be preparing for a job that you don't even know about yet. And that's going to be perfect for you. Um, and so I would just suggest go with what you really enjoy, not necessarily I want to make money, so I gotta to go to law school or I gotta be a doctor. And if you love those things, great. But if you don't, don't do it. Yeah, and you know, when you think about it, if that is your mindset and you're like, oh, I need to go to law school, 
law school can be expensive. Um, and if you don't actually go into that field, because maybe at that point you realize, oh shoot, I really don't want to do this. You know, it might, it might end up doing the opposite of what you wanted it to do. Um, and so, yeah, just take your freshman year. I know we haven't even started college yet, but um, take your freshman year of college and just try to do as many things as you can. That's what I'm trying to aspire to do so that I can be, you know, exposed to a lot of things and be open-minded. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's really important to not put yourself in a box um, and to restrict yourself because that's what college is for. College is for learning about yourself and what you want to do. We have a couple questions from the Google form that I sent out. The first question is, when you started high school, what was your dream college? Is it the same as ninth grade currently? What were some of your essays about? Or I guess, let's answer the first one first. So what was your dream school when you started high school? For me, um, I, <laughs> I watched a lot of Gilmore Girls when I was in late middle school um and so I was like I want to be just like Rory I want to go to Harvard and I want to get into Yale and I want to get that big envelope in my mailbox and get into all these places and so I was like I if I don't get into the number one college in, in the country I'm going to be a failure and it's like girl you are like 14 years old <laughs> um so you know <laughs> as I've grown older I have realized um that was kind of dumb because it's like there are so many good colleges out there um and of course I am still applying to hard to get into colleges but I have a more realistic expectation of those um and no college is perfect like I, when I visited Harvard I was honestly underwhelmed and I I Thought about not even applying um, <laughs> because I was like, I don't even know if I'd want to go here. Like a college is a college, even though it might have this big fancy name, it doesn't mean that it's better than every other college out there. So take what you <laughs> are wanting to do at the beginning of high school with a grain of salt. You will learn that um, it's not all about, you know, name dropping a college and being like, oh, I got into Harvard. No. <laughs> go to somewhere that you know will make you happy um and so now my number one school is U Chicago and U Chicago is really hard to get into yes but I find that it as a whole has way more values that align with my values in terms of um diversity in terms of financial aid they do a really good job of um you know providing a lot of money to families um who apply there and they have these quirky essay prompts. Um, and so I saw those essay prompts and I was like, I like, I like the way that they think. Um, so like the one that I answered, which this goes a little bit into the essay, um, it was like dog person, cat person, pineapple on pizza, no pineapple on pizza. Um, there are only two types of people in this world. And so I talked about that um, and it, it just gave me the sort of freedom that I hadn't gotten with any other essays for any other colleges. And I really liked that. I really liked that they were open to this sort of discussion um, that has to do with pretty much nothing, but leads to um, an ending conclusion that makes you think a little bit more about life. So yeah, it, it has definitely changed throughout the years. Mine too. I have almost the same exact thing. I was like I'm going to Vanderbilt and I'm still applying to Vanderbilt but I recognize that it is a reach college and it is not in my top three or four or five and um, it would be lovely to go there and I do really like Vanderbilt but um, my it's not it's not like I have one school that I want to go to I think that's what changes the most is that um, once you start looking at schools you start to think, okay, well, if I got into here with a scholarship, that would be my top choice. But if I got into here with this, with this program, that would be my top choice. So it really does depend on um, 
the different things that the schools offer and scholarships and money and all that. Um, and so I don't think I necessarily have like a top choice now. It's, um, it will just depend on what I choose on in May. Um, so we'll see. But then for the second question, um, it's kind of a two part. What were some of your essays about and what were some, some of the most notable essay prompts? So the most notable essay prompts, um, I really enjoyed the questions that were like, talk about something that had an impact on you, whether it's like a book, movie, TV show, like talking about Mia, because um, I am, re I really enjoy this show called Northern Exposure. And a lot of my personality is based around the fact that I like Northern Exposure, been to the place where it's filmed and so on and so on. And so I can really talk about that. So I really liked questions that I felt like were targeted to things that I could talk about. Some of the hard ones I applied to a scholarship today and the essay was define justice. So, you know, that is a lot different than describing the impact of a TV show on your life. You know, that takes more time. And so um, it really, they're notable in different ways. And some of them are really fun and some of them really suck. But um, my personal essay, I kind of talked about it earlier. It was titled, um, do I talk too much and other burning questions? Um, and it was about the fact that I talk a lot and how that has negatively and positively impacted my life. And then I used it to say like, um, it's important to have a voice and, and share your opinion and all that. So that's kind of what I turned that into. Um, but that I tried to use something playful and then turn it into something more serious about myself. Um, what about you, Sula? Uh, my main, like my personal essay was about circles. Um, and so it was about basically, I talked about different ways circles have been in my life. Um, and there were a lot of things like talking about it being full circle, talking about the unit circle, um, <laughs> talking about eyes and like the circle of the eye and how I like to draw eyes a lot. Um, and so honestly, it just takes a lot of introspection um, and finding common things in your life. And part of my personal essay talking about full circle is my cat Milo, he um, was born in a barn and they found him in the walls of the barn. And so we adopted him. And this past August, we discovered four kittens that had been born um, in our backyard. And so um, we took them in, we fostered them, and it was a very full circle moment. It was like, oh, I'm getting to help these kittens, like how Milo was helped and how I acquired him. And of course, we adopted them out. Um, and that was really hard, but I was like, you know, I'm giving them to people who will appreciate them just as much as I appreciated Milo. And so just taking these ideas in your life um, and just talking about things that have really made you who you are um even if you don't know who you are like it can be hard to really just define yourself um but just thinking about the things in your life that impact you greatly um it can get you going in an essay so it, it'll take you far <laughs> and then some more questions here um is it more is senior year more busy than the rest of your years and do you feel stressed as you did um through the rest of high school so senior year has been really busy. Um, I was online last year, so I had a lot of free time that I do not have this year because I'm back in school and the college applications. Um, we talked about this a little bit, like dropping things that are, you know, taking too much of your time. Um, so it's not like I don't have free time or that I don't like have time to spend with my friends. Like it's not like I'm killing myself, but it is more busy, um, especially being back in school. And so it's not like so busy that I wish I wasn't doing it. Like it has been fun and there are some cool things about, I mean, obviously some cool things about applying to college and learning about what your future is gonna look like. So it's, a, it's an exciting transition time and it's busy, but it's not like you wanna die. <laughs> like it's, it's fun, it's fun. Um, and then the second part, um, did you feel stressed? I mean, some parts are really stressful. Yeah, like that's just how it is. Um, but, you know, junior year is also incredibly hard. Um, the 
classes can get really difficult junior year. You start taking a lot of AP classes. And so I don't know if it was more stressful, um, but it is, you know, you feel like you're doing something big and about to um, really have a big transition. So I feel like most of my stress, I just think about where I might be a year from now and uh, I, I can um, feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I feel like we as people who had our junior year do during like virtual, I think there's a lot of variation because I had a really difficult time last year because um, I didn't have that much free time even though I was virtual. Um, and so it really is unique to each person. Um, and this year has definitely been more stressful than I thought it would be because I thought that I got all my stress out junior year. Um, that has not been the case, but um, I could see it being the case for a lot of people um, where junior year, because I've always thought, you know, junior year is the hardest year. And I would say it still is, but it's a different type of hard than senior year. It's definitely two different experiences. Um, senior year is more like looking at your life and being stressed <laughs> as opposed to junior year doing work and being stressed. Um, and so, yeah, it really just depends on the school, the person, um, you know, what classes you're taking, um, but you'll get through it. I think of last year and I'm like, wow, I got through that. I can get through pretty much anything. Um, and I, I feel like that's pretty much how most people will feel. Also, the big difference for me between junior and senior year was the fact that after junior year, I had to do senior year. And after senior year, well, after first semester senior year, um, really, the work goes way down. After you stop applying, especially even in your scholarship time when you're applying to scholarships, you know, your workload starts to go down at school because teachers are ready for you to get out of there. And you start to have all these fun events happen, like uh, prom and um, we do like senior breakfast. So there's a lot of, it becomes way more rewarding senior year than in junior year because in junior year, you just go and go and going. And, you know, it seems like it's so far away until you graduate, but in senior year, you can really look at it. Um, and so I think that is the main difference for me. Um, and then, the second set of questions, when did you ask for recommendation letters? We answered that. Um, when did you start writing your application essays? Honestly, for me, it is all a blurry mess um, because <laughs> I'm done with it. I started writing my personal essay at the very end of the summer. And then for the applications, like I said, I just did them in tiers based on when they were due um, and other things, but like, for the early action, I was writing those a couple weeks probably before the due date, and I was just writing them as I was doing the applications. It's you know I wasn't doing like essays and then submitting them all at once. It was like just each each school, you know, one by one, um, and so it really just depends on you um, and what your list looks like and what your plans are. Um, I wouldn't say like you have to start writing your essays super early, like. You, you have time um, at the beginning of the process to kind of think through everything and decide what when you want to start writing. When did you start, Sila? Um, I started mine in around September because um, I wasn't really inspired to write it until I had this interaction with these kittens. Um, and so it can take a while before you get any sort of inspiration that hits you and it's like, oh, this is good. Um, and it's okay. Like, that's okay for it to take a while. Um, and as for the other essays, I would write some the night before just because some of them, they don't take a lot of, like the, the U Chicago essay, it's more, you know, talking about more nuanced things that you don't have to talk about. You don't have to think about over a long period of time. You just kind of lay out your argument and that's that. Um, so, and, you know, I would talk to people about your personal essay. People are willing to look at it and read it. Um, like if you get your parents to read it, um, ask them if it represents who you are um, or even read some of your friends essays to get some inspiration. Of course, don't copy them, like don't copy the basis of them because then that's not you. Um, but yeah, you can get inspiration from a lot of places. 
uh, when I started writing my personal essay, because I was really, really excited to get the process started. So I, I feel like I sound like I was doing things like way ahead of schedule. I was just like really, really, really ready to, I am ready to go to college. And um, I, you know, have not really loved high school. And so it was just like, I just really, really, really wanted to get started. Um, and so I wrote multiple, well, I wrote half of, you know, this essay and then half of that for my personal essay, um, trying different things, trying to see what kind of essay I wanted to write, what I wanted to write about. And what has been really helpful for me the whole process is the fact that my dad has been helping me a lot, um, which I'm super grateful for. You know, we spend Saturday morning sitting down at the breakfast table, talking through what scholarships are where, and that has been super, super helpful. Um, and so what we did is when I finished writing like four, you know, little bits of four essays, he read through them and said, okay, this one is not going to, you're not going to do well if you submit this one, but hey, this one, if you do this to it, it might sound really cool. So it, like she said, it's really, really great to have someone else look at it um, and kind of tell you, this doesn't make any sense. What are you saying here? Um, and kind of give you some advice. So then a couple of these questions we've already answered, um, but how do you recommend managing your time throughout the application process? I kind of talked about this, but um, I just keep lists of scholarships um, that when their dates are, um, and like I said, making the tiers um, and kind of thinking about what is doable and what isn't doable, what's worth it and what's not, like the outside scholarships. Um, you don't wanna fill all your time doing bold.org scholarships when you could be applying for honors programs and you know full tuition scholarships at, at the colleges you're applying to. So how did you um, manage your time, Sila? Um, not very well. Um, <laughs> I kind of just applied whenever I wanted to, and it just luckily worked out that I got stuff in by the deadlines, um, which I don't recommend, but that's just where I was at. Um, I mean, because there's stuff that happens in your personal life that just kind of makes you not want to do anything. Um, so it's completely understandable um, if you don't manage your time very well. Just honestly, my number one advice is just make sure you get it in by the deadline. Like, just, you don't want that to be the excuse why you can't go to that college. Um, you know, if, just keep your options open. Don't put too much pressure on applying to, you know, specific colleges for specific deadlines. Like, if you're not feeling a college very much, do the regular decision. Um, there's no problem in doing regular decision. Um, just know your deadlines. Just be sure to take like 15 minutes one day and look up all of your deadlines and just promise to yourself, I will get these in before the deadlines. <laughs> um, but if there is a college that does get you really excited about applying to a college, put extra effort into applying to that college. Um, you don't have to put the same amount of effort into applying to a state school that you're in versus a reach school. Um, just just be smart about it. Just know your limits and know what you need to spend your energy on. So that is all the questions that we have. So if anyone has anything else, submit it. And the last thing that I wanted to add um, is that there can be a lot of pressure to attend certain colleges, you know, not not go to the one across the street or not go to a community college um, or not go to a state school. And honestly, this time and this experience is yours. And it really doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about your decision or your application process. It is really what is gonna work best for you and what financially, um, what, you know, what your parents can do for you. Um, it really depends on you. And there is nothing, nothing wrong with wanting to not go to college, wanting to go to a community college, you know, not wanting to apply to private schools because it is so individual. Um, and I know like there's even pressure within my friends or like the kids in my grade. Um, there can sometimes feels like there's a difference between people who are um, have applied to a bunch of colleges and people who are just starting the process or people who are going to a four year, people who are going to a two year. 
just ignore that, you know, do what is best for you, go where is best for you, it'll work out. Um, community college is a, we haven't talked about it a lot, but it is a really, really, really fantastic option. Um, it can help you if you your score is not where it wa you want it to be or your GPA is not where you want it to be. Um, go to a community college, spend two years focusing and you know getting that 4.0 and then transfer to your dream school because now you can can get in like there are so many options um if you don't look like Sila and I you know that's fine there are so many different ways to um go to college or to not go to college um and you should really do what works for you yeah and community college and state colleges can honestly be the best financial decision you make of your life um, uh, and by the way, thank you, Angel. Um, but it can, it can take you so far in whatever you're doing, because by saving that money early on, that can open up so many opportunities. Um, and so, and even if you don't want a lot of opportunities, it's just smart to save money. Um, and so, you know, don't let your pride get the best of you to, to be like, oh, I need to go here. At, even if you can't afford it. No, just there's no shame in anything. Community college is a great option, honestly. Like it, it can get classes out of the way. It can give you this perfect foundation for so many other jobs um, if you're not wanting to do further education. And honestly, even undergrad um, at a school that maybe, you know, is closer to home. Graduate school, if you want to go to graduate school, it sets you up really well. Um, and so, yeah, there are so many options out there and so many routes that you can go and you just have to think of what's best for you and what is um, just the right route for you and for no one else. Don't let, like Olivia said, don't let other people get to you. That's easier said than done, of course. Um, but in the end, it's for you and these people in high school, you're probably not going to be around them for the remainder of your life, if you're going to different colleges, they don't, don't let a few people in high school define the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> because that, um, you know, you'll be proud of yourself at the end of the day, if you make this financially smart decision. And you're like, I really, you know, I got through college without having to pay this amount of money. Um, and I got a great education. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad Olivia brought that up because it's really important. For example, the University of Alabama was really, really low on my brother's list, but when he got in and was offered a scholarship um, that, you know, made it so that it was a really good option for him, um, he went there and he loved it and he loves the University of Alabama and now he is at law school at Georgetown Law, which is a T13 law school. And so it really does not, if you don't go to Harvard, it does not mean that you're not ever gonna go to Harvard. You know, there are a lot of different ways um, to get where you wanna go. And there's no problem with going to a great school like the University of Alabama or Jeff State or anywhere like that. I mean, um, it's really what works for you. So I hope you, this was helpful for you guys. Um, and I hope that you took something away. If you have any further questions, Please do not hesitate to reach out to Sila or I. Um, I know it, it's obvious by this that we enjoy talking about it um, and we will talk your ear off some more if you would like for us to. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys um, enjoyed.